Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Director of Peer Programs at Jewish Funders Network. And on behalf of JFN, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar on remote learning and engagement, best practices in online adult education. This is the first in a three-part series on remote learning and engagement. Upcoming sessions will address other issues such as using technology to facilitate Israel encounters. That's on February 3rd, between 1 and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And Jewish educational experiences, that's February 17th, between 1 and 2 p.m. Eastern time. And we are very excited though to start this series off diving into best practices in online adult education. Um, since March, 2020, there has been a very few educational interventions and initiatives that have not had to pivot to the virtual delivery of services and programs. While some institutions have expanded already existing capacities, others have had to radically reimagine their educational practices and business models. And in some cases, this has uncovered ways of reaching never previously imagined audiences. In this session on professional development, we'll hear from funder, practitioners, and researchers on their findings on remote professional development and adult education's offerings of 14 programs supported by the Jim Joseph Foundation. Today, we are fortunate to be able to hear from Stacy Turner, Director of Learning and Evaluations at the Jim Joseph Foundation, Mark Hurwitz, Vice President of Program and Talent at JCCA, and Meredith Wucher, Senior Program, pro, sorry, Senior Project Leader at Rossab Consulting. So thank you all so much for being here. And with that, I wanted to um, hand it over to Stacey Turner, who will get us started today. Thank you. Great, thank you, Tamar. Um, I'll just frame um, the, um, the work that we will be talking about today. Um, going back to the fall of 2017, the Jim Joseph Foundation funded a multi-year initiative of 10 grantees to provide professional development to up to 500 Jewish educators who work in a, ver a variety of settings. So all different kinds of Jewish educators are um, receiving professional development through these 10 grantees. Uh, we've contracted with Rosoft Consulting to conduct an evaluation of the initiative. And it was important to us that the evaluation was structured so that there was a, a real focus on learning in real time. Um, and in part of doing that, uh, the, the um, evaluation firm, Rosoft Consulting, pulled together the 10 program directors um, to form a professional learning community. And so the evaluators and the professional learning community really decided to work hand in hand to decide what they wanted to learn. And uh, they met quite often throughout the year to, to hear what the evaluation was learning, to reflect, um, and then to, to ask more learning questions of the evaluators. That was all going great. Um, and when the pandemic hit and um, all of the in-person convenings were forced to shut down. Uh, we know, as you all know, that uh, programs had to quickly pivot um, and decide what, what, what they wanted to try to provide online and how. Um, and so we saw that um, our 10 programs, as well as other professional development that was happening in programs that we were funding outside of this particular initiative, um, were trying new things and they were trying new things quickly and um, telling, reporting back to us um, things that they were learning. And so in the spirit of pivoting and being responsive to what we all wanted to learn, we asked Rosoft Consulting to pivot um, the plans for the evaluation and to do a, a deep dive into how the pandemic and the, and the shift to online learning was um, was was happening and impacting um, the programs. And really we wanted to learn um, from the program directors, how was this experience for, for them in making decisions and trying to push out learnings online as opposed to in-person. And then we also wanted to hear from the participants um, who were who were involved in the professional development. How was that going for them? Um, what were the um, pros and cons of, of learning online as opposed to in-person? Um, and so that is the, 
evaluation work that Meredith is going to present in detail for us. Um, and so we, I just want to say, like, we learned, we knew that there was going to be learnings for moments of crises, um, but we also knew that there would be learnings for, um, for, for the post pandemic. Um, it wasn't just that we all couldn't meet in person, but we knew that, that there would be some, some great learnings um, to think about even when we all can be in person. So I'm gonna turn it over to Meredith and uh, she's gonna present what we learned. Thank you, Stacy. That's a uh, fantastic introduction to, uh, to our research project. So I'm just gonna jump right in and share my screen and share the presentation to show you all uh, what came out of this um, really fascinating research study that Jim Joseph Foundation in their interest in, in pivoting the research as the organizations were pivoting really allowed us to dig into. So we called this virtually developing to uh, give the sense that obviously a lot of this was happening in virtual format and also that this is an ongoing and uh, developing field that we're all continually learning from. So as Stacy said, this study grew from the larger professional development initiative that uh, Jim Joseph had been uh, funding for a number of years. Um, so we investigated, it turned out by this point, there were uh, nine ongoing uh, programs that it made sense to include in the study from those original 10. So we had those nine and then we added four additional ones that were also Jim Joseph grantees and who were offering either professional development or just general uh, adult Jewish learning that we knew would provide some really rich data for the study. So it progressed in these four stages. Uh, we started with interviews with the 13 program providers because we knew even before learning from the participants, it would be really important to hear from the providers themselves, you know, what, what had this process been like of taking, you know, all that they had prepared, you know, many were uh, ready to launch really intensive and, and fantastic in-person retreats and programs. What would it mean to have to pivot it all to an online format and how did that work for them? Uh, then we took our learnings from that and used it to develop a survey which we ended up sending to, as you see, over 1,600 program participants. We actually sent to more, but we got responses from 1,600 program participants across 80 programs. Uh, so really a very wide array in the Jewish community. We did additional follow-up interviews with 14 participants of these programs. Uh, for these interviews, we tried to focus on participants who had been part of either more than one program or were part of these longer term professional development cohorts. So they would have a lot of really rich uh, insights to share. And then we also were able to observe seven of the programs virtually. Um, and this is one of the, the findings we'll get into that of course, everything moving online means it's much easier to uh, hop on the Zoom call and become part of it and, and observe and see how things are going with our own eyes. Uh, so these again were the key research questions and Stacy already mentioned them, but I'll just go through go through them again. We wanted to understand what were the personal and professional impacts of the online programs. And we kind of had as a guide uh, some of the personal and professional impacts that we'd already been studying uh, from these professional development programs. So we could see which ones seemed to be able to continue once the programs had moved online. Uh, we really wanted to understand though, you know, what were the strengths and limitations of online and virtual learning as compared to in-person learning? Um, and again, in this case, the fact that some of the programs had made this shift and so participants had experienced both, that really helped us with that. Others were shorter term programs that had really just come online after the, the pandemic started. And then we wanted to learn a bit about not just the, the what of online, but the how. You know, how were program providers uh, presenting these programs in ways that could facilitate the learning and make it uh, richer and more effective? Okay, so I'm gonna start with the positive. You know, what, what did we learn about what online programs were able to achieve in a really effective and impactful way? So the first thing, and um, you kind of alluded to this, Tamar definitely did in her introduction, and I'm sure you know, many of you uh, seeing this have experienced this, that uh, going online expanded access to learning for you know, many different kinds of populations in really 
profound and important ways. Um, you know, clearly not having a geographic boundary, um, you know, no, no need to travel, no need to um, you know, fit, fit a retreat or a seminar into your schedule. You know, all of that just made it much easier for people to both find and access these learning opportunities. Um, and the lack of travel and the lack of, uh, you know, signing up for in-person conferences also made things much more affordable, which, you know, again, we, we heard from a number of people really was a factor in being able sometimes for the first time to access some meaningful professional development. Uh, online learning can be more family friendly. Um, there are, of course, challenges to trying to multitask at home, but certainly, you know, there were people who said I could never have uh, gone away to a conference, left my children behind, but, you know, absolutely, I can participate virtually and manage to balance with the child care at the same time. And then, uh, very interesting, we asked about different kinds of um, accommodations people might need um, for you know, differences in their, their learning, um, different kinds of abilities. And we certainly heard that in, in some ways, online learning is more accessible. You know, there are just certain um, kinds of challenges or, or physical limitations that you don't have to worry about or manage for if you're learning from your home. So, and this is something you know, we heard from participants and also from program providers that they were in some cases just astounded by the, the new people that they were seeing showing up in their programs who they had never heard from before, you know, people from around the world. And this was really um, profound and moving for many of them. Then the second positive impact, um, again, in wanting to understand how did online compare to in-person, that you know, one of the key goals, obviously, of professional development or adult Jewish learning in general is uh, increasing knowledge and skills. People said you know, that that was definitely happening for them. They were able to feel that these programs were effectively transmitting the kind of knowledge and skills that they were looking for. Uh, in many cases, these were kind of very practical in nature and you know, often had to do with technology itself. In some ways, being online and learning online meant they were uh, seeing and absorbing best practices for online learning, which of course became you know, all the more important and relevant as the educators participating were pivoting online themselves. So it was kind of this nice uh, circle of, of skill development. And then finally, um, having to shift online again, you know, when we spoke to program providers and, and those interviews were done in June and July. So, you know, they, they had experience, but we're still maybe in those first uh, throes of figuring out what they were going to do. There was a real mix of kind of trepidation, but also excitement and realizing that this provided an opportunity to think out of the box and think more creatively about how were they going to provide effective learning and professional development and you know, how would they themselves have to become more skilled and expert in online learning. And you know, for many, as I said, that, that was actually a real source of um, excitement and their own professional growth and creativity. Now I'll just share a little of the data behind those conclusions. And we have uh, both quantitative survey data and some qualitative data from our surveys and interviews. So these are just three of the key statistics that led to those conclusions. So in terms of, in terms of the percent that said they gained new knowledge, 79%. Um, the, the next two are about how would you compare your online experience to in-person learning of similar programs. So 75% said it was more convenient to participate from home and 58% said it was easier to fit into their schedules than, uh, than in-person similar kinds of learning. And then we have a few nice quotes that also uh, encapsulate this. So, so the first from a program provider um, captures that sense I was uh, talking about of sort of a bit of nervousness, but also excitement. Uh, as uh, she said, specifically, it's terrifying, but also an amazing opportunity because no one can say, you know, this is how we've always done it. Everything is different now. And then two participants talking about uh, the first one, again, that issue of convenience and accessibility. You know, you can just hop on for a one hour session in the middle of the day. And normally they might get such a, an experience only by traveling to a conference. And a second participant talking about um, 
how, how it felt to do tech training on Zoom and then the fact that they are using the tools as they are learning them through this online environment, you know, really, really made it feel um, much more possible and doable. So these are some of the, the great quotes that we heard. So now I'll talk a little bit about the how, what, what makes online learning particularly impactful and effective. And the first finding that we heard, which you know, was really interesting to, to realize is that in some sense, um, I'm not gonna say the format doesn't matter, but the core of really good teaching and learning um, is, is the same, whether in person or online, it's having you know, meaningful, high quality, uh, compelling, engaging content taught by talented and effective teachers. So, you know, in some cases we, we heard that, um, you know, they, even if someone might have preferred to hear in person, you know, this was so compelling, they were certainly able to absorb it online as well. And we saw that, I mentioned we, we did some virtual program observations, that really struck us in one particular observation where it was a program that you know didn't um, really use any technological bells and whistles. They, they weren't trying to be particularly creative. It was essentially a, a talking head on a screen. And yet, because the teacher was so good, the content so compelling, um, it really seemed like the participants were quite engaged and gave very good feedback. So that's that sense that you know whatever you're doing, you still need that core of quality content and teaching. That being said, moving online, of course, does give the opportunity to experiment uh, with some of these creative technologies that people did find, you know, um, further enhance their ability to transmit knowledge and engage people effectively. So, and I'm sure, you know, you've all experienced many of these by now. Uh, Zoom breakout rooms, of course, have become very popular and, and we definitely heard from people that use of that really encourages interaction and community building. Uh, people talked about how, and this is especially in kind of ongoing programs and sessions, uh, use of videos, podcasts, uh, materials that people can access asynchronously off screen and then come together for discussion and um, you know, interaction, that's a really effective way. You know, what, what is called the flipped classroom is a really effective way to uh, transmit learning online. Um, there are all kinds of these apps that have popped up, Padlet, Jamboard, you know, different ways that people can creatively interact with each other beyond simply talking um, in the, the Zoom boxes. And then finally, Zoom chat, again, something I'm sure many of you have used, is a really interesting tool. Um, and you'll see there's a, a quote on that. Um, it, in some ways, it encourages a, a kind of ongoing um, like side-by-side -side conversation. So you have what's happening on the screen and then there's ways people can interact on the side without interrupting the, the main presentation. And many people found that very effective. So uh, this is some interesting data on um, both how prevalent and how effective various tools were. So, so the green bars are how effective, how many people um, rated a certain tool effective or very effective. And then the purple is how many of them actually experienced it. Or in some ways, it's, it's the other way around. So of the purple people, how many of them rated it effective? So what you can see is the effectiveness ratings are very high across the board. You know, actually experiencing these things tends to work very well. However, um, it also shows that there's still a bit of a ways to go in terms of really making full use of the various technologies uh, that some of them, you know, say towards the bottom, you're seeing less than a third or, or about a quarter of programs actually using them but when they do use them, they're very effective. So it's kind of an interesting uh, note to the field that as far as people have come, they could go further. And in fact, the more creativity and experimentation, the better. And now a few, few quotes to share again um, about these creative uh, uses of technology. So the first deals with that asynchronous and synchronous balance that I talked about where, you know, it's, it's great to deliver content asynchronously so that you can use your synchronous time to interact. And that also helps reduce people's uh, Zoom fatigue and, and time online. 
And then the second quote from a participant is about um, that, that um, effectiveness of the Zoom chat. And you know, as, as this person says, there, there's less pressure when speaking up and it actually can um, you know, increase the opportunities, say for people, for introverts, for people who don't really want to be putting themselves out there on screen, having that use of chat is just a nice uh, other, other opportunity to interact and share. And now we come to the challenges and limitations because you know, we certainly found that for all of these positive impacts, you know, there are ways that learning online really isn't the same as in person and, um, and it's kind of about finding a balance. So the, the main thing we heard, um, which again, probably won't be surprising is that there are simply limitations to how uh, deep a virtual connection can be. That um, when people, and again, this came up a lot when we talked to people who'd had both experiences because their programs had pivoted. And when they thought about what is it to do our uh, retreats or our um, conferences online versus what they had experienced in person before, you know, they, they really missed it. They missed the intensity of being with each other. Um, you know, as it says here, this in the uh, lack of informal schmoozing was something we heard a lot, that it's just not the same online because everything is pretty structured. And in person, you can find your times to grab someone in a hallway or sit with them at dinner or you know, keep building that kind of community. Um, and then it's also uh, has an effect on the learning because again, there are there's just less time to process the content. You know, you don't have your sort of conversation after the class in the same way. It can be more intimidating to reach out to an instructor when you can't just grab them between sessions. So all of that certainly does have an impact. Also, the, the nature of the online medium, it can of course be more distracting. Um, it's kind of the, the flip side of the convenience of uh, learning from home is that it's also more distracting to learn from home. You have often your, uh, you know, family responsibilities. There's uh, media around. Some people said, you know, it's really hard to just have one screen up at a time. I want to check my Facebook and my email at the same time. So all of that has an impact. Um, there can also be, you know, technology can get in the way as much as it can facilitate if there's technical challenges. And then, of course, the, um, you know, famous Zoom fatigue that we've all heard about and experienced, it really does have an impact and the kind of um, exciting learning that you can do in a day long session or, or retreat, you really can't spend the full day online. So it really does just cut down on the sheer time and engagement that you can have. And all of that together led to this sense that um, virtual learning and professional development, uh, again, while they can be very useful for transmitting knowledge, there's kind of a, a limit to how much depth and impact that we didn't hear about the kinds of you know, really um, life-changing or career-changing experiences or insights that people shared when we were studying these programs in their um, uh, sort of intended in-person form that just dropped away somewhat when they had to shift to online or when we were studying programs that were solely online. Um, it can kind of take you so far, but, but maybe not the, the full level and um, heights that you would want. And again, here's some statistics to share on that. So these are, again, um, comparative of online to in-person. So this shows people disagreed with some of the positives and agreed with the negatives. So um, majorities dis disagreed that online learning helps them meet new people, build deeper relationships, or is more engaging than in-person programs with similar content. And then about half agreed that it was harder to stay focused. And then finally, we have the, the comments that um, sort of flesh this out and, and show how people were feeling. So the first from a, a program provider uh, that, again, that sense that there's just a lack of not being able to be with your cohort, especially if you formed these bonds, um, you know, not, not the same when, you're, when you can't be in person with each other. Uh, the second is participant who's talking, you know, kind of honestly about these distractions that are around um, and the inability to be fully immersed in online sessions. And then finally, um, kind of 
pulling that together to this sense that, you know, as someone said very bluntly, no comparison between being together in a room versus being on the screen. And, um, you know, this person felt, you know, used the, the term lack of authenticity, um, perhaps you might say of depth, of engagement, but again, that, that sense that there is just a, a limitation to what can be fully achieved with online learning. So kind of bringing that all, all together into our conclusions, what we felt we saw is that um, rather than thinking of either or, and this is especially now thinking ahead to when, when we're post pandemic, when we really have all the options available to us, what, what can we learn from this um, experiment that was kind of forced on us all is that actually there's really value to both. Um, that the online programs, you know, as it says, offer this unique convenience, flexibility, affordability, access. You know, there, there are, are people out there who, you know, if they live in small towns or in small communities or for whatever reason, they're simply not going to be able to access a really intensive uh, in-person or ongoing in-person experiences. And online programs are, are kind of a lifeline for them professionally. And, and we definitely heard from some of those people as well. So that's one you know, unique benefit that shouldn't be discarded and lost. And the second is, the, um, as we said, the increased innovation and creativity that has grown up around this and all the expertise that people have developed in online learning, you know, really valuable and something that can and should be carried forward. And at the same time, you know, in-person clearly does offer superior connection and engagement. Um, you know, we, for that reason, will never really want to move to a fully online environment when the options are available. And what's interesting is that, again, because some of the programs we were studying were these long, longer term cohort programs, so they experienced some of both, that actually a hybrid approach can work quite well. And many of them were already using a hybrid approach before COVID precisely because their participants were spread across the country or even uh, internationally. And it makes sense to kind of bookend with intensive in-person experiences to have that bonding, have that cohort creation, but in between, you know, using online in effective and meaningful ways can really, um, you know, increase the, the frequency with which cohort members can connect with each other um, and not just Zoom. Like we've heard from, you know, many programs that they use WhatsApp or, or other kinds of technologies to just have that kind of constant uh, connection and contact, which is really important. And for the programs, it certainly does um, have an impact on budget and affordability and logistics to be able to say, you know, we'll have just enough in-person experiences to get what we need, but we really can leverage and use the online uh, tools and technologies and opportunities we have to, to keep the contact and the learning going in between those times. So, you know, in the end, our, our recommendation is to the, for the field and community to think about both and rather than either or. Um, and I think I am now handing off to Mark, who is one of the uh, program providers of the programs we studied. Um, very eager to hear your, your reflections on this, you know, what, what resonates for you, what rings true, what, what does this data uh, raise for you in terms of think, thinking or questions about how you might move forward? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Meredith. This research is uh, fascinating and important, um, especially for those of us who needed to pivot in real time. Uh, the research reflects what we've done and how we've done it. And maybe even more important, as Stacy said before, to really think about what we will take with us, as you've been saying, Meredith. Um, those of us who work in Jewish education understand that our goal can never be or should never be that we return to March 13th pick up the mantle and keep moving wherever we were from there because we're in a different world and we need to reinvent ourselves and we need to also think about what we've learned during this time. I'm going to take a few moments to tell you about our program so that this makes sense and has some sign of context for you. So at JCC Association, the Sheva Center is our department for early childhood Jewish education and family engagement. And the grant that we received was for the Sheva Center Leadership Institute. 
we noticed that there was a dearth of leadership in early childhood, and we were looking to form a cohort in order to bring people together to be able to not only be leaders in their communities and regions, but we were looking to create a group that would advocate, advocate for children and their families for the next generation. So we did a number of interviews and chose 30 people. Ours was one of the longer programs. It was a three year, it is continuing to be a three year program now extended to at least three and a half years. And we had six in-person retreats for a week each. We did two international seminars, one in Israel and one in Reggio Emilia in Italy to talk about the philosophy, the constructivist philosophy that is so popular in this country as well. We had virtual monthly meetings before the pandemic, so virtual was not completely new to us. They had assignments, they have Chavruta partners that they studied with online before they um, needed to do online. They were receiving a national director's accreditation from National Lewis University, the McCormick Center for Early Childhood Leadership, and they were doing that online as well. And they had mentor and coaching visits monthly, which they also did online from the very beginning, except that mentors and coaches did visit two times so far um, during the course of this um, fellowship. One of the great gifts that we gave ourselves that we didn't know was even coming is that I really believe that you need to front load in-person visits at the beginning so that people can bond and therefore have virtual opportunities where they already know each other, have felt each other, have understood each other, have been together. And that we did not knowing what was coming. And so four of our retreats and both international seminars happened within the first year and a half, almost two years. And we were very grateful that we did that, um, not knowing what was coming. Uh, the other thing that was online that has continued to be important, but was very important from the first week they met, was WhatsApp. Um, our fellows, every one of our fellows are on WhatsApp every day, all day long, talking to each other about work, about, especially during the pandemic, what do you have for this? Do you have a copy of that? What are you doing here? Do your kids wear masks? What do they have to do? And I'm pregnant, I'm going to have a baby, I'm getting married, um, I, I need a recipe for something. And I have to tell you that without exaggeration, it is happening, there is not a moment during the day or night where my phone, which I now have turned off the beeping for, um, is not going with people talking to each other, which is quite remarkable. Our very last retreat, and I'm talking about this because it's important, was in the very last week of February, beginning of March. You see how close it was to the pandemic when we were going to do, we did a really remarkably big and um, for us daring experiment. We decided that we were going to bring leadership teams for each of the 30 fellows together so that together we could talk about supervision. We could talk about how leadership teams need to work together throughout a JCC in order for the Early Childhood Center to really maximize its potential throughout the community. And we brought 100 people together in San Francisco. Um, we brought executive directors of each of our JCCs. We brought supervisors of the fellows um, who were mostly not the executive directors. And we worked on providing a toolbox, a toolbox for them to understand supervision in, in a program that was thinking about a constructivist um, philosophy and pedagogy. And we talked a lot about things like appreciative leadership, which I'm sure you've heard about by now. We brought our entire staff with us. Our CEO came to speak to the group. We had representatives from the Jim Joseph Foundation, from Rosoff, and it was quite a remarkable event. Um, we'd spent five days, different people spent different amounts of time, and um, we were hopeful, and we were looking forward to continuing these conversations and continuing to work this way from the moment we got back. I'm gonna pause here to say something that is sort of tangential, but vital and important. I talked about how everybody gathered with us, our friends from Jim Joseph and Rosoff. I have worked and had the pleasure of having grants from many, many, um, many different foundations, all of which were wonderful. I have to say that the group of people from the Jim Joseph Foundation and from Rosoff and from our work at JCC Association, they provided us with so much support, so much leeway, so much opportunity to be flexible as we entered this time. 
and stood behind us in all of these experiments. They wanted us to try things that might work and might not. And it was really easy to tell them when we failed and when we needed to move forward because that's how we learned and that's how we moved. And I never wondered about whether I should keep a secret from them because from the very first day, it was clear that's not what they wanted. So the pandemic hit and the very first thing that happened to us that was really difficult was that we had to furlough our mentors and our coaches because of financial reasons um, from, the, from the organization and from the way we were using the grant. And um, that meant that those of us who were still on staff had to take the responsibilities for all 30 of the mentor of the fellows in order to have them continue in some way, not nearly as, as um, intense as they were, be able to watch for them. We, we then um, began our virtual work and we began to support them as they began to support their people. Um, JCC, so JCCs across the United States and Canada began to open up earlier than anywhere else. And pretty much in July, we had almost 100% of our early childhood centers up and running, and they have been running ever since. And so they were exhausted, tired, nervous, anxious, and we felt it was our responsibility for the fellows and beyond to make sure that they had the support that they needed as they were pivoting as well. One of the great advantages and one of the great things that happened during this where there were two populations we have never really reached before that we spent a lot of time with. Classroom educators are in the classroom when we're doing professional development. It's very hard for them to come out of the classroom to learn and at the end of a day when they're working six, seven, eight hours a day, they don't want to come back at night to be with us to do professional development. But in the early days, Many of them were furloughed, but many of them were not working in school, but they were still on staff and getting paid. And for two or three months, we had professional development for educators that were really remarkable. And those months of professional development were really remarkable for them because they connected with educators across the United States and Canada they've never done before. They realized they were not alone. They realized that even though every JCC had a different feel and was in a, diff in a different community, that they really saw 200 schools that were like them, that were dedicated to children and families, that were working hard every day. And it was a, an incredible thing to see. And it was one of the things that we are now working hard to continue to do in creative ways. So that's one huge learning we took away. The other huge learning we took away was families were peering over their children when they were um, at home and learning virtually. So they were seeing what early childhood education looked like in a very present way. And they were engaged and listening. They also wrote to all of our JCCs and said, we can't wait for you to get them back. We don't know how you do this. This is really hard. Um, really hard for families to not only keep their children on task on video, but also to do their own work. And so we're now, we did offer programs for families during that time. People were available during the day. People were available at times to be able to learn and grow. And so we did that. And we're also thinking and beginning to do things like that as well, to try and maintain that as, as much as we possibly can. So our changes needed to be, we have two retreats left. Um, and we have now done two virtual retreats um, since the pandemic began. And we had to think about what a virtual retreat looks like because we knew what we couldn't do was take our retreat and put it online. Just like everything else online, you cannot take a panel discussion and just put it online like you would in front of an audience. You can't do anything unless you reinvent it. And so we reinvented virtual retreats. They were week long, but they were just an hour, two different, about an hour or two or three some days on different times of the day so people could come in and out and make their choices. So every day we began, we begin all of our retreats with morning ritual. It's just an opportunity for us to gather and sing, be together, to check in, to see how we are. So every day of those virtual retreats, we had one of those. In addition, we had the fellows teach each other and they were teaching about the kinds of things they were doing in their schools. At the beginning, it was about pandemic related uh, issues. And over the last four or five months, we're, we're back to learning about important um, pedagogical and philosophical things about um, the early childhood world. In addition, one of the things we got to do that we never had to do, we invited our directors from the field. The, the directors from the field could come and listen to the fellows who were presenting. And so they became a part of a real world, which is what we were going to introduce them to 
as they moved to the end of the fellowship. But we had directors, we had 70, 80 people coming online to hear these young leaders talk about what they're learning and what they believe in. And that could never have happened in any other way. So that was another bonus that we had at that time. And during those two virtual retreats, we realized we needed to have fun. And so for the second retreat, we sent them a care package before the retreat, a couple of weeks, and we took them with us. It was a, we were celebrating a year from our trip to Italy, um, which we had taken a year before this past November. And so we contracted with Mama Noda and her granddaughter who were in just outside of Rome. And we did a pasta making evening with the, with the fellows and, um, <laughs> We sent them aprons that were personalized with their names on them and a gift card so they could buy the material, the recipe things that they needed with them. And we spent almost two hours learning how to make pasta with um, Grandma Nona and um, her granddaughter um, from Italy. It was quite an incredible event. And we learned from that and from other things, as Meredith talked to you about, the in-person is never like the virtual, but boy, you can have good happy hours and you can have opportunities if you just do, and if you do them in the midst of a week of learning, then you're combining the intense learning with the ability to let their hair down. And boy, I have to tell you, these, these educators, all early childhood educators across the United States and Canada in Jewish settings and non-Jewish settings have been going through such stressful times. One of our jobs was to make sure that they, um, they really understood that as well. So I'm just gonna quickly say last week, last week, just last week, we decided it was time to resume the work we'd done in February. We could not do it before. Our executive directors were deciding on life and death decisions. Do we open, do we close? Our early childhood directors were greeting people on lines and taking temperature. But last week we felt like we were in a place where we could and we thought, will they come? Will our executive directors appear again? Will our fellows be able to take the time? We gave them a lot of notice. We had a two hour session and we had 100% participation. Every single person that needed to be there was. And although they have been talking to each other a lot, our fellows have not resumed these kinds of conversations. And now we see a renewed effort in that way. And so they're going to continue to meet virtually monthly. And um, we are thinking about how to incorporate them into um, the world of the, um, early childhood directors that we have as well. We're about to head up into our professional conference in April and they will be there as well. So we've learned an enormous amount about um, how virtual can make a difference in people's lives. There is never going to be a time when we believe that virtual is a substitute for in-person, not ever, ever, not in the world of Jewish life. Jewish life and living community, the kinds of things that we do together, they cannot be solely done, solely done in um, virtual places, but they can be enhanced, grow, embrace them, and they can even do, they can do more than we could with only personal and in-person as well. So I'm gonna stop so we can talk to each other. And I, I have a question to ask um, Stacy and Meredith that I, I wonder about. I was in the middle of all of this. I knew what was happening. You were doing the research on what we were seeing. And um, I wonder if there were surprises. I wonder if this is what you expected. I wonder if what you, what you read, Stacy, and what you've been putting together, Meredith, was, were there any things that surprised you or was this pretty much what you expected to see? Stacey, I'm going to let you go first. Yeah, I did a lot I mean, of talking. <laughs> sure. I think that um, at this point in January of 2021, we, we read the report and a lot of it is um, validating. I think that we, we went through 2020 and every, every one of us was sort of collecting anecdotal evidence about how this was going and we all kind of have come to the point where we, we realize, yes, of course, of course it makes total sense that there are some things you cannot do um, online and that, that, and that an online experience can open up your audience and can open up the presenters that you can bring. That it all seems so intuitive, but I don't think that when we decided to do this in June, it was super, in, it was into it. We didn't know what we were gonna find. And um, I, I just wanna say that I, I think there, there's tremendous value to doing this 
work just to even confirm what we all think we know. Um, I think we were at an advantage because in the very beginning when we were when we were selecting um, the 10 grantees, we knew that it was a best practice to have in-person um, professional development that was um, that was uh, um, sustained with some sort of not in person. So we were sort of imagining that it would be um, phone calls with a mentor or or check ins with the program director in some way, maybe over Zoom, maybe over phone. But we um, we didn't imagine that that there would be whole trainings that would be happening online. Um, but we were, I think, at a little bit of an advantage because because we did select programs that had already sort of built that into their programs. Um, it wasn't like all of a sudden they had to go online um, without having any experience with that before. And uh, I think I'll just add to that. I mean, I think we had somewhat of the same experience where um, we were seeing things in this study that we were hearing and, and seeing in other research we were doing and it all was kind of uh, coalescing to, to paint a, a pretty consistent picture. And I think what struck us both with this and, and other um, uh, clients we, we heard from was this issue of the expanded access and the, the numbers that programs were seeing, the, the different populations. I think all of it was intuitive, but still really, um, you know, great. And I don't, I don't know, surprising, but um, just uh, exciting to, to see uh, evidence and, and data supporting that and realize the, the power uh, and potential of these online opportunities for people to, um, you know, ex expand what they could do in terms of professional development and Jewish learning. I actually have a question for Mark, and um, I wanted to know if you felt um, equipped to do the virtual retreats, for example, or if you felt like there was a learning curve. And I and I'm I'm asking because we're thinking about ways that we can potentially support organizations to do this online work well, um, or if that is just you know, in the days that we are now, people either know how to do it or they don't. I think there's no question there was a learning curve. There continues to be a learning curve. The difference, if you had been on our first virtual, been with us on our first virtual retreat, the difference from that to the second and what will look like the third when it comes down the road are night and day. Number one, um, we knew how to get online, but how to manipulate and, and uh, use all the bells and whistles that we needed to was one thing. But the more important thing was what do people want and what can they take while they're working and what can they really move away from? This is not a typical time. A virtual retreat, not during a pandemic, would not be the same as one during this as well, mm -hmm. because many of our directors or these leaders, they're not all directors yet, um, were really needing to be walking around the building all day and making sure that everything was was in happening so they couldn't leave mm -hmm. to be on the screen all the time so we had a lot of on and off but we also learned techniques we have a wonderful team of people who work together and we all have different expertise and we all did a lot of research to figure out what we could do to engage people and um, the other nice thing about virtual is that you have people who will be willing to come and speak to your people who would never be able to before. Wonderful people in Jewish life and Jewish education in the secular world. And you know, some of them, some of them waive their fees. Some of their fees are so much people who are going to come and do two days with you, doing an hour for you or two hours with you on a screen. It's a very different opportunity. So we could have people we never could have had before as well. So we learned and then we asked a lot of questions. Um, we Every time we did one of these retreats, we sent out a note to everybody participating and they know to be honest. Um, we, we Meredith actually came to our very first retreat. Um, she appeared um, the very first day. We hadn't even met the fellows yet and she was with us. And we all, we were all a little nervous. Um, we had just started with Jim Joseph and we had Meredith coming by. She 
made everyone feel very easy about it. And she started to talk to people and they said, what should I say? What should I say? And we right from the very beginning said, you have to say exactly what you're thinking because we're learning from, Meredith is not here to grade us. She's here to write about what it is. And she wrote a magnificent case study for us that we used for the rest of our time and will use in the future. Um, that was a great gift from Jim Joseph as well. And so um, we, we, you need to ask questions, you need to create safe spaces so that people can give you the exact feedback they need to and they don't hold anything back from us. And so we learned that way, it was really important. Yeah, one thing you said reminded me that something I try to keep in mind about learning what we've learned over 2020. And yes, it was sort of this moment of an accelerated experiment, but having to having to also remember that that um, the participants and the program directors, everyone involved was under this intense pressure just from the 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 health crisis and the economic crisis that that um, isn't, it's not just like we moved to online and everything else was the same. So to remember that's that. True. Is important. That's true, that's true. So I, I see someone has uh, put a question in the Q&A um, and it looks like uh, uh, some of it is about the research we did. So the first uh, piece of it is, did you have any learnings about recruitment and retention were applicable? It, that wasn't actually something we focused on um, it, in some ways, because as I said, a lot of these were programs that had started before the pandemic. So it wasn't specifically about um, you know some of that, um, how did people come into those programs might've been done previously. And for the new programs, um, I don't believe we, we looked specifically at how people joined. Um, we were kind of more looking at the impacts once they did. Um, but the, then there's, uh, so similarly was participation motivated by the institution and structure facilitator subject area. Again, um, we didn't ask specifically about motivation, but I can certainly say in people's uh, comments and interview comments, and maybe um, in particular for some of the programs that were, were not the ongoing professional development, but the new uh, adult Jewish learning programs where uh, you know, some of the organizations pivoted to online. You know, certainly there were people who um, shared, shared comments that they were really excited to have the opportunity to learn with such and such a speaker. Um, and this absolutely gets to that point, Mark, that you brought up, which is really important. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention it in the presentation that the, the, this idea of expanded access really does apply to the teachers and, and educators and speakers as much as participants mm -hmm. that write um, organizations who you know, would not have had certain people be able to come join them for an in-person conference or retreat, uh, you know, could have them pop on for an hour or two on Zoom and really expand their ability to bring, uh, you know, renowned speakers to their participants, you know, speakers from Israel, talking to a North American audience, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So we, we absolutely heard that as a theme. So I would say, I, I think that ability to access, um, you know, high, again, getting to the high quality content and, and teaching ability to access that online was a factor in people's excitement to join these programs. And then finally, were online programs able to reach people who would otherwise have had no connection to that provider or would simply have gone through a different provider instead? So in, in, in terms of have had no, would have had no connection to that provider, absolutely, because that gets to the, the geographical limitations of if you have a New York-based organization that is only offering in-person programming, you know, clearly there's a whole um, you know, continent full of people who might not be able to join in person who now have the opportunity to join online. So that was certainly a big factor. And cost too. Yes. Definitely. I, I, I know that I'm relatively sure you didn't um, research this and I hadn't thought about it until um, just, just a bit ago. Um, but my wondering is um, whether people um, in longer cohorts lost people during this um, virtual time, people dropped out. Mm -hmm. Or what I do know from my colleagues from being in the professional learning com community, which was also a remarkable gift from Jim Joseph and Rosoff, um, whether the people who were trying to recruit, because 
even though we had a three-year program, there were many of our people who had a year program or 18 months. And I know that some of them had more difficulty recruiting because of, and, I'm, and I don't really think it had to do with virtual as much as people's lives, but I wondered if you'd heard anything about um, any of those things in, in your travels. I know probably not part of the research. Yeah, that, that we didn't hear. Um, also, when we were speaking with, because I think a lot of that might have come from the program providers, at the time we were speaking with them, they may not have yet been looking to recruit for the, the next cohort. So mat matter of timing, but it would be fascinating to do follow-ups with them now. I don't think any of the programs that we are funding now are having difficulties filling spots. I think that it might you know, some of the people that might have signed up before maybe didn't, but there have, there's always other people who are interested. So I haven't, we haven't had that particular issue. We, we actually in previous fellowships have had um, a larger percentage of dropouts than we did this time. Um, we had nobody leave. We had two people leave. One was illness and one was, she left her position, uh, but we had nobody else leave. And I think they need, when we get on the screen and they see each other, they're just, they're very emotional. They're just very emotional and so happy to be there. It's just, it's an incredible, it's been an incredible gift heightened during this time. We can find the, um, the case study that Meredith wrote for the Sheva Institute um, on our website. And it's, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful case study. You can, you can see sort of the, the emotion that Mark is referring to in, in the case study. Very good. And I know we only have a moment or two left. And thank you so much for everybody that participated and to Stacy, Meredith, and Mark. Um, I, maybe what we want to quickly do is if all of you have a last reflection or, or question to, um, that would be a wonderful way for us to, to sign off on this part of the conversation. Sure. I mean, I think we're at the foundation. We're just thinking about how to take what we're learning um, and support organizations to do this hybrid approach because we know um, we know that that is not going away. Um, so, looking forward to talking with other funders about their ideas on how we can do that for the field. Mm. Meredith, did you want to? Um. I think I you know, just hope that uh, what we were able to discover and share is valuable for uh, the people listening in. And if anyone has any follow-up questions, uh, since we only had the hour today, uh, please uh, feel free to contact me or any of my colleagues at Rosoff Consulting, and we would be absolutely happy to, to share more with you and also uh, brainstorm with you if there are additional questions you have that you might like to, to research and, and think about in terms of your grantees and the programs that you're funding. Thank you. And Mark? Yes, I'd love to say, since we have funders and foundations on the line, that the complexity and the richness that was to think went into the thinking between Jim Joseph and Rosoff, the opportunity, I, every, I had regular meetings with um, my own person from Jim Joseph I had regular monthly meetings with somebody from Rosoff. I got to work with Meredith on the case study and we had our professional learning community um, in order to talk to each other, both um, when we were together with remarkable programming in different parts of the country or in between. And then we had opportunities to be with the other folks. Stacy and I got to know each other well during this and other people from Rosoff and I. And, the amount of wise people and support and opportunities to check in and to make this the best it could possibly be is something that really needs to be thought about. It was, it was complex and rich and wonderful and a great gift, not only to me, but to our staff, to our fellows, and I think in, in the product to the Jewish world. Thank you. All right, well, thank you all so much again. Thank you, Meredith, Stacy, and Mark for for sharing your wisdom and sharing this learning with us so that we can reflect and, and think about how it works um, in our personal lives and our, our work. And thank you everybody who participated. And we look forward to continuing learning together in, in, future, in future webinars and other virtual opportunities like we heard about today and how, how it brings community together to learn. 
So thank you all and stay well. Have a good day.